Hi, welcome to this week's edition of Blues Talk. We're again John, Dave, and myself. We're going to look back over our victory against Glasgow. Look back at also all the other results of the Pro 12 and look forward to our big game in the Aviva Stadium against Italy on Saturday. So, boys, it was a great game uh, in pretty horrible conditions, but a really good advertisement for the Pro 12, I thought. It was a properly done egg, a Scotch egg, if one will. Mm. Um, it was <laughs> it was, a, it was a really good game. It, it, really you had two it, really yeah. good teams going for it, playing good rugby. Both teams played good rugby. Excellent. A few little mistakes, but, you know, that's what... You know, good teams cause the opposition to make mistakes. Um, you know, great night's entertainment. Great to come away with the points. Very important to come away with the points because other results went our way and we were able to take advantage and we'll talk about that later. But um, all in all, very pleasing evening. Yeah, I was very impressed. Um, just with, like you say, with the game itself. Uh, they gave us lacquery and we gave them lacquery. And, you know, we, it, the result was always in doubt right up until the final well not quite the final whistle but close enough probably mm. until they took that penalty mm. that they probably shouldn't have if they were going to go for it um, but yeah credit to both sides they were really scrapped for the win and they really you know they went for it a uh, lot of a lot of impressive players on both sides uh, especially, especially um, encouraging to see your man Richie Vernon do so well when we've got Jordan Coughlin trying to do the same thing, <laughs> turn from an eight into, well, in his case, a 12. Mm. Um, so, you know, having a big six foot four, six foot five guy playing 12 or 13 is, you know, a lot to be said for it in the modern modern game. If you're if you're tough enough to play with a pack of forwards and you stick yourself out in the centre and you're fast enough to run with the backs, the sky's the limit. Yeah. Although, although, to be perfectly honest, I mean, the, it was more, more pleasing to see actual backs play well. Um, I thought uh, again, as he has done now consistently this season. Um, I thought Noel Reed had a very good game. Um, he looks very dangerous with the ball in hand. He really, really First does. Try was um, you know, really you could good. you could criticise some of the Glasgow tackling, but you, you also have to give credit for the footwork and 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 the angle he took. You know, and 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 the, the offload from Cronin and the pace. You know, there was there was all sorts of good stuff. I think Glasgow. You know, you're right. They could. They will probably, in review, be critical of that decision with regard to the penalty, but I don't know if they could have foreseen what Leinster would do for the last, no. you know, three minutes. Because, you know, we have talked over the year about how we've been making mistakes, in, in, uh, sometimes at crucial times. And we, th- those last three minutes, we really shut that game out. Yeah. You know, that was error-free rugby. Yeah, yeah it was. It, it reminded me, obviously, we had the ball this time compared to the match against uh, Saracens in Wembley. Mm-hmm. But it was yeah. still... it was. A huge amount of discipline like we didn't go off our feet we didn't get penalized in you know when we had the ball maybe a bit like unfortunately we couldn't do it against the all blacks in the, in the mm. match in november mm. we really did it mm. yeah. but it, it was just it was it was a similar to a certain extent it, it was confidence in the team you know you have to have confidence to play like that and to yeah. do that kind of thing um and i thought we did i mean it was it was a heartening performance all around from one to 23 you know yeah, i was very happy well the 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 noticeable uh, absence no, one to 22. of Goffert, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which I suppose was due to Madigan having a good game, very good game actually, and also, you know, reluctance to change a player who's playing well right at the death when you know upsetting the balance of the team even slightly might jeopardise the result. So mm. you know, in another on another day, you might want to see somebody like him with a safe pair of hands in mm. inverted commas so yeah, won't to, to close topics. out the game. Uh, but uh, you know, Madigan was rightly trusted to finish out that one, uh, and it's great. He, he, great play, to he, see. Play, he played very, very well. He still yeah. got one or two things in his game that really annoy me. Um, uh, his decision making can be. He does tend to get a rush of blood to the head. I mean, that stunt drop out he tried, you know. Yeah. And he did he come can back. He usually have enough talent to get himself out. He of usually trouble. well, that's the thing about him. you see. Normally, he, like we've seen Ian Madigan do things like t- run the ball from behind his own line, but he has the step, he has the pace, he has the strength mm. to do it, and he gets away with it a lot mm. of times. Sometimes he doesn't though. It's just this tiny little thing. I mean, o- otherwise I thought his performance was very, very good. It would be a shame um, to see people coach that out of him. I mean, if you absolutely. think back to the match against um, against the English English Saxons when he um, in, in Gloucester's ground uh, yeah. about a month ago, yeah. when he took that mm-hmm. tap penalty, you know, an awful lot of other out halves would either you know kick it in, into touch or give it for a scrum, but he just took the initiative. Went for it. Went, went for it. it. And, oh yeah, no, that's that's what I'm saying. But but sometimes you do have to you do have to play the percentages. I mean, I yeah. mean, people think rugby is about entertainment. It's not. It's about territorial domination. Mm. It's about subjugation and it's about the excision of control. Well, that's what the game is about. That's what it was invented to be about. That's what it's still about. 
There's a time for there's a time and a place <laughs> for all of these things, you know. There's a time and a place to be tactically, uh, you know, right. close out games. Uh, I always, Dave obviously prefers the Andrew I, Martins. I, I, I prefer I, the Carlos Spencer. Yeah, well, yeah, well who's the one like going both. down in history? I um, like I, both. You see, the thing is, I, I I know I always sound like George Hook when I say this, but uh, <laughs> you're starting to look like him now. Yeah, as well. yeah. But rug, rugby as a game was invented to be. You know the British Empire. I in, talk about it, Dave. <laughs> to be the British Empire in microcosm on the playing field, so that the the young men of the posh schools could learn how to run the empire, and that's what the game is about. And I mean, it's still about that. I mean, it's still about territorial control. It's about subjugating the opposition, and it's about controlling the opposition. That's that's what the game still is today. Now you can do it either through the Carlos Spencer way or the Andrew Mertens way. But it's Andrew Merton's All Blacks who were the dominant force in most of the nineties, not Carlos Spencer's. Yeah, it's, it's just it's the beauty of well, the game a, that you can depends. do both. You but know? If you, if you, it's not about one or the you know, other. Let's go back and look at the nineteen ninety one Australian team exactly. when they could have taken a three point drop goal to draw the game against Ireland. They didn't. They went for it. They had the balls, the belief. But who, in who, was, who was the out half? Well, but the, no, that's the point I'm making. That's what I'm making. The, that and I'm not. This is. I'm, we're not talking about Madigan really at this stage. We're moving on. But. Uh, Michael Lina was the perfect out half because he knew, and so was Andrew Mertens to a certain extent, and so is Dan Carter, and so is... They're very well balanced, all the yeah. ones you're mentioning. They all there, have, right? but they all know when they to do it. it. And that's, what, that, that's the one thing that I think, the one, you know, little one or two percent in Ian Madigan's game that he needs is not the ability to do things because he has the ability to play a, a, a territorial kicking game. He has the ability to be... To go in and play scrum half and throw a mad pass yeah. out to win the game. He's right? the ability to run around and do all that stuff. It's the it's the knowledge of when to do it. It's like Brian O'Driscoll said, mm. you know, knowledge is knowing that tomato is a fruit, <laughs> wisdom is knowing that it doesn't belong in a fruit salad. And that's that's the next stage. That but I mean, we're talking about a young player. I mean, that's Very the next young. stage in development. Mm. You only get that through experience and he's yeah. getting the experience. And the game against Glasgow will have been another step in, along the way for him. I thought he was very, very good. Um, I thought he marshaled the back line well. I don't think it's any fluke that the back line looked better than it has yeah. in any number of weeks now. I'm not, I'm not saying that as a down to, to, to Goppert, who I think is a very fine player. I just think that the balance was better with Madigan, with, yeah. with uh, Reid and with McFadden there. I thought that was a really well-balanced centre three quarters come half back. Yeah, and, and uh, Reid looked really good going, mm. like, going forward. He was just scintillating mm. at times you know he really was yeah I just I just checked back over the last three matches the team sheets and I'm only looking at the start and 15 in each of those three mm. games not one forward played all three games in fact none no forward played in the um, in the Cardiff match that played in both the in either yeah. of the the Dragons or the uh, the match uh, on Saturday and also only three of our backs played in all three games uh, Reed, Fanjo and uh, Kirshner right. yeah. I thought and as you mentioned Dave like I thought most notably Madigan in played in two of those games or started in two of those games well I think we were helped out there by the way the international weekends fell because we had so many players away with Ireland uh, and all the bench players needed game time and I think it was the Dragons and this weekend were the two uh, the, the two free weekends uh, so we got the benefit of like the whole Ireland sub front row mm. We got a few others uh, back from like Ruddock and Madigan himself coming back for just at the right time. It actually played out really well for Leinster that we could rotate our players mm. and obviously that we had the players to rotate. I mean, we had players who went away and got a, a, a bonus point win against, okay, Cardiff who were absolutely on the floor, but they still had to do their, their job and playing together in an unfamiliar combination. Um, and then you know, previous to that, it was um, it was the away game in Italy, which you know the same kind of players all mm -hmm. had to line up together and bonus point win again. And and yet again, another another kind of young player got a got a good boost in his career. And Sam Cockle Murray he looked very oh, very yeah. comfortable. Mm. He made a try saving tackle yeah, there yeah, at looked, one stage. Was he looked really two. good? So you a know, nice guy. Is it's he? a. I mean, we said it last year actually. You know, this over this period of games is where Leinster. Leinster won the Pro 12 was over this period of games. And if we're to win it again, it'll be this period of games that wins it for us. And going on next year, if we're going to be strong in the Pro 12 and the Heineken Cup, it's the guys who've got game Good, time yeah. at this time of the season yeah. who'll be the, the backbone of the team next year. So, it, I mean, it, it, it's all good for Leinster. I mean, it, it has worked out we've really, taken, really well. We've taken 19 points, points out of a potential 20. 20. Yeah, it's, it's, know, like, it's just great. And we were seven points behind Munster uh, at Christmas. And they were a point ahead. Mm. 
Yeah. And didn't we have a similar turnaround last year? I mean, with I remember Ulster, you yeah. with Ulster, Ulster. We, we, we yeah. caught up with them. Yeah. 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 Now we never quite took over, but we, we caught up from quite a while back, far while right, back as well. We were so unbeaten up until the middle of December yeah. in all so competitions. It just shows you put a run of games together, and we said it before. It's all about momentum. You, you you said it before. I mean, momentum is really really important. You get a run of games together, you start to get a run of wins together. The wins start to follow one after the other. Yeah, uh, it's a habit. Yeah, well, why don't we look at some? We scored three cracking tries, and um, first one was Cracked Reed's. Them open there. I thought I thought he took this try superbly. I did, yeah. Well, everything about it was good. I mean, it was good, a good strong run back, it was good rook, and then the break was great. Yeah, it was the Cronin's pass. I think made it. As yeah, well. it was, it was yeah. just perfectly timed. Which how many times have we said offloads kill teams? There we go, and it just everything was. He hit the line just right. Yeah. Cronin got the pass, timing just right, but he still took out a defender or two. A hint of comedy tackling on one of them, but, the was, know, but the, he, he the, stepped them as well. Like it was yeah, well, that's it. The angle, the angle that re- I mean, obviously, I, I, I would be very surprised if Gregor Townsend were all that happy with the tackling, but Reed does change his angle multiple times. And you can make, make players the look different. bad just by shaking your hips. Yeah. If you look at the way his hips go here, well, you can't see it now, but watch it here. Just stepped around him and caught him. He just caught him off. Off balance, you know, and the the first tackle actually took him out of the second tackle. Yeah, you know, which which always helps. But uh, you know, but that's 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 kind of. I mean, Reed Reed has deserved that. He has played very very well this season. Mm. Um, he's got a number of tries. He's pushed himself, if not into the reckoning, at least into the into the public mind, into the perception, mm. for you know bigger days ahead, and. You know, he was a guy who was previously seen pretty much exclusively as a 10. Yeah. But, you know, he seems to be moving into that kind of second 5-8 role. Mm. Well, I, I think he had a game against, uh, on, a, on Easter there in the B&I Cup a couple of years mm. ago against Munster. And I don't think he's seen him play 10 too much since. No. Yeah, he, he, he had, had yeah. Day. Yeah, didn't he? His goal yeah. kicking in particular. Yeah. But, uh, you know, Paddy Wallace made a career about, it. well, not made a career, it's, it's Cheapens, but is a very, who is a very good player. Well, Paddy Wallace was the only second 5-8 in Ireland. As a result of that, you know, he always got selected because he was the only one of his type. He could play 10 12. He could yeah. play 10 12 or could play that 10 12 role, mm-hmm. you know. Um, no, Reed is pretty much the only one of the younger guys who's, who's, who's really playing that role as well. You know, it's, it's, it's like being a tight head prop. If you can prop on both sides, you'll always have a job. Yeah. If you're a second 5 8 in Ireland, you'll always have a job. Well, I guess Madigan's doing a little bit of that as well. But he is more, a little more bit jobbing yeah. on it. Yeah, I suppose. he's more jobbing on it than, than what Reed appears to mm-hmm. be, who seems actually to, have, 12, yeah. to be designed for that role almost with yeah. all those gifts he has he, he reminds me an awful lot he's quicker and he's younger obviously but Christian Warner when Christian Warner was at his best for Leinster mm-hmm. back maybe 2005 2006 yeah, yeah. well like before we look at, at Fanning's try like we had a couple of penalties that, that Madigan got and again it was tough conditions for him to kick but the lead up to I think his third penalty we had a we had, they actually had a, a put into a scrum we shoved them off it and got the penalty from yeah. it like I thought our scrum was very impressive it was destructive before mm. um, it broke up a little bit when the when they changed around the front rows yeah. and uh, I think it was Strauss and Ross came out. Yeah, they brought on yeah. John Welsh as well, which yeah, so you know, it can be hard to know who who to blame, but uh, it was definitely when when and I suppose as well that uh, that but front row I, I for Ireland are, 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 are they're pretty much know, a unit. Yeah. They're a unit exactly. They changed they changed their tactic. Um, they were trying to. They were trying to. I mean, in fairness to Glasgow, they tried to scrummage straight and square. I mean, there were very few resets if you recall mm, in the yeah, game. Yeah. Glasgow were trying to scrummage against us, but when we made the changes and they made the changes, they stopped trying to scrummage. They started. You can see them. They started lifting the scrum. Mm. Yeah. You know, the the props start popping, just not to give us that that front foot advantage. And they had enough yeah. experience. John Welsh, he's only young, but he's been around a couple of years at this stage. And they've enough experience to know how to do it without mm. getting caught for it, and that's what they did. Yeah. So, the, to a certain extent, that fair play to them, you know, they found a way in negating an, a, an advantage we had. Yeah. Yeah. When we look at F- Fanning's try, he actually got man of the match as well, which I was Great a bit surprised about. Mm. Uh, he's, he's he was very that. happy about it too. I think the, the thing we, to we, watch here isn't Kirshner's hands, it's Kirshner's face. Because he sells this pass, it's a yeah. no look pass, and he absolutely sells it. Beautiful, though. It's his not looking that mm. brings Matuwalu in. Yeah. Matuwalu is convinced that he's not going to make the pass or he's going to pop it back inside yeah. he, so, he sold it so well you know it's it, tiny little things that are class but it was still a fantastic pass to oh make. it was yeah yeah. but like I, I'm delighted for Fanning I thought One he's hand. copped an awful lot of um, an awful lot of bad press and I think it, some of it is very unjustified he's not fashionable no. Well, because he didn't come you know a, a 19 year old straight out of some school and straight into 
the, the academy you know he's kind of well, he's, he's come great, through the hard way he's a great news story though isn't he yeah, I mean brilliant. guy <laughs> doesn't give up comes back ends up playing for his province you know hmm. that's everybody loves a story like that you know and great to see him cap it with a try there'll, there'll, there'll always be certain players who have a, a certain narrative behind them that are more popular than, than other players even though those other players work harder Mm-hmm. Um, you can you can even just see it actually. You can can't see fault it. him for his work. Oh no no, but you can see it. You can see it in the the reaction to say it, it, between say Quinn Roo and Tom Denton. Everyone wants Quinn Roo to be more successful. I don't know why. And Tom Denton, though Tom Denton is the one who's doing the work in the mm. B and I Cup games and improving his performances to get into the Leinster squads. Yeah, everybody's going oh Quinn Roo. Quinn Roo doesn't seem to be doing the work. Yeah, well Quinn Roo had a kind of a like he came with a bit of a big rep because he was mm. only about twenty and he was smashing guys over in South Africa, um, and we all thought we were gonna be you know and it, what you hear about him as well in training he's supposed to be just viciously strong, uh, and so for somebody so young he's yeah but like, he got knackered in that match against uh, Glasgow he last got season you know and like he wrecked his shoulder ago, I think. yeah um, and you know it, that takes a while to get your oh, yeah, confidence but, but back up the, to the point I'm making is that. The narrative behind the two players is very different. Oh, of course, yeah, of course. you know, um, and the popular perception of the two players is like, it's like it's like Fanning and say Hudson. Now Hudson's a very good footballer, all that he's yeah. really good, but you know, people would kill Dara Fanning to get Hudson in the team to a certain extent, you know. And Fanning's done it for us week in week out. People, yeah. uh, people are watching games trying to find yeah. things to criticize mm. him and, about. And don't forget, as I mentioned earlier, he played in all three of these games, and yeah, you know when we when we need, minutes nearly when, all of them as well. when all of our lads are away with the national team, he's the one been picked consistently, mm. yeah. and he's the one that's getting the results for us. Well, you know, Matt O'Connor is in the mug. Yeah, you know, let's face it, mm-hmm. uh, and he obviously fancies him. Now, there's a rumour that Darren Hudson's away at the end of the season, so maybe that's why he's not getting the, the game time. Perhaps. But, you know, there's also, you know, a school of thought that thinks, you know, we, he must be doing something good in training. Mm. Um, like, we only see the guys we, for 80 minutes, We you see know? them at uh, 80 minutes. And that, that, that Leinster squad environment is a very elevated environment. I mean, if you, if you even want to survive... To catch any notice in training, you're tr- and you're training with British yeah. lines and world class players all the time. Mm-hmm. It's a very elevated environment. Maybe that's why himself and Denton are doing so well. They get mistaken for each other. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe Matt O'Connor likes a bit of ginge. <laughs> maybe he does. Well, I think this one, this next try is from uh, from Ruddock, and I think he has been our outstanding player this season. Oh, I'd say he's so. He's, if, if, he's if, on if, fire. If there was a player of the season vote now, Rudder could win it. It'd be close between him and Marty Moore, but I'd say Rudder could win it. Mm. Um, he's just so strong. Mm. It's mm. just... Bates' his way yeah. through here. It's just unbelievable. Like, do you Kirsten know, was actually not, very close yeah, there. Yeah, he was close. But do you remember, no right to score this. No. Do you remember the try that he kind of set up against Cardiff a couple of weeks yeah. ago? Yeah. Like that was just sheer brute strength. He must have driven 15 metres into the heart Straight of the Straight through and nearly scored a try himself again. I mean, his power is just. I mean, it took him a while and. But he didn't give up and kept going. Kept yeah. Going. It took. It, I mean, in terms of. Like, that's so hard. How yeah. did, you know? But, and the guys he's up against as well. Big, yeah. strong props and, you know, guys that he got through there were just. But it took him a while to grow into his power. Mm. I mean, he's still only what age is he? Twenty three. About fourteen and a half. Yeah, <laughs> but it it took him a while to grow into his power, but now it's it's in full flowering. I mean, he's he's you know if he, depending on injuries to Peter O'Mahony, he could find himself starting on Saturday. Yeah, I think he should. Good if, hands if there if to get O'Mahony. that ball down. Mm. But like, there's another. I know we're going to talk about Ireland late later, but uh, you know, would you have any fear seeing him popping up instead of O'Mahony? Not a bit. Or Kevin McLaughlin. Or you know, uh, Henderson. Mm. No. If I saw any of the three of them starting for Ireland, I'd be happy as a happy as a clam. Mm. No, uh, funnily enough, the only number six that I would of of all the if you like international or our provincial number sixes, I wouldn't like to see starting would be Robbie Dyack. <laughs> Possibly, um, yeah, yeah, and I wouldn't that's, be too. That's no slur on, on Robbie Dyack. That's yeah. a comment on the quality of the others around him. Oh, I mean, he's a good solid player, Pete, but you're talking about Peter O'Mahony. You're talking about Kevin McLaughlin. Uh, Ruddock you're talking about uh, Henderson you're talking about John Muldoon as well he's still a very good player in yeah. my opinion of course the weekend um, yeah who could have who could have had a much more uh, glorious career if he moved away from Connacht yeah. but didn't but he's a very good player as well I mean we seem to have a, an absolute production line of back row forwards in Ireland at the moment we yeah. really are churning them out and we even see like you know a couple of weeks ago we see young guys coming on into the team that are making their debuts mm. and tries like yeah. it's ferocious really it's, the, the yeah, it's, a, it's a great position or even Jordy Murphy you know yeah. coming from you know, relative obscurity to 
getting his international Start debut. Yeah. Yep. Come on. I mean, they could. Up they the could. I mean, he could decide to go with, with with both Murphy and Henry. Henry has played at six a couple of times as well. So, mm-hmm. you know, he, he, Eddie has options or not. Eddie, Jesus, <laughs> Joe. <laughs> what the hell? Two coaches ago, um, Joe has options. Mm. Yeah. When you say Henry, I think uh, yeah. Uh, playing starting him at seven, you mean? No, starting starting Henry at six and at starting six, Murphy at oh, seven. Okay. Yeah. He could do that. I mean, it's mm. it's an option he has. Have a lack of height. Might have a, yeah. might be a bit of lack of height at the back of the line out, especially against Italy's Italy. rather good line out. It's been very good all season. Zani is out though, which mm. is well, you we'll know, get, we'll might might Italy. might weaken the tail. Mm. I started it. I, apologies. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that, that obviously we've mentioned that that uh, that win moves us up into first place, and we're on fifty nine points. Munster on fifty eight. Munster narrowly beaten by Clanetley at the weekend, and rather dubious circumstances with a controversial uh, disallowed try. Mm. Mm. Don't know how controversial it was. Well, it didn't look like a knock on. Well, it did look like a knock on. The problem is not what is. Well, is, it looked like it was. The problem is out. what caused it. I mean, the mm. ball was knocked on. What caused the knock on is another matter. Or knocked back. So whether it should be a penalty. Yeah, well. Or a penalty try even you could is another matter. It. But it was, the ball was certainly knocked on. Yeah, well, you could debate. You could debate it till mm. your face was blue. Well, that's the thing. Like, I mean, there was a lot of criticism of, un- of, of of Dudley Phillips, but at the same time, you know, I think if you're going to throw throw uh, criticism at referees I think also you have to throw compliments to them as well and I thought Nigel Owen just going back to our own game was superb in he that was. match and really yeah, let the yeah. game flow in poxy conditions I mean it didn't stop raining for most of it a swirling wind and you know we had a great game yeah, of rugby you expect that with Nigel Owens I mean he is he is the best referee in the world he's the governor he's the man you yeah. know it's as simple as that <laughs> he we, came out with another classic he did yeah <laughs> he said uh, he said to the forwards who were getting a bit scrappy in his scrum that's just 14 other lads who want to play rugby here come on let's go <laughs> <laughs> but that's 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 Nigel but uh, you know going back to the, the, the thing I mean yeah, you also have to understand both the laws and the procedures and the protocols in play the idea is that a TMO can't give anything really unless it's clear and obvious mm-hmm. now if you look at the incident right the ball left Duncan Williams' hands in a forward direction. Mm-hmm. That's undisputed. And you couldn't actually see another Scarlet's hand no. knocking it out of his I know, you know, and you know that a Scarlet knocked it out of Scarlet. his hands. Right? We know it. But it can't be proved you to the television to pictures. And that's yeah. the thing. Mm-hmm. And, that, and, that, and that's the problem. I mean, people often say, well, we know what happened. And everybody does know what happened. Anyone who's played the game knows what happened. But the problem is, knowing ain't proving. Mm. And, that's, and that's the problem that the TMO faced because there's such a all their angles are on the screen and everything that they say be- between themselves and the referee is on there. Mm. You know, that's that's kind of the problem. That people know what's happening, but they don't know the protocol behind it. Mm. Well, that was actually a very, very good game. I mean, Munster and Garlitz were going at it as well. I mean, there was two turnover tries, mm-hmm. um, one each way, and a bit of a yellow card, a bit of controversy. I mean, what more do you want in a game? I, I mean, it has a bit of everything. For the neutral? Yeah, an underdog win. I mean, as soon as the other results, Edinburgh beat the Ospreys, who seem to be on a bit of a decline at the moment. Yeah. Um, they, have a, they have a narrow squad. Mm. Um, and it's a young squad as well. So, you know, they're going to have peaks and troughs. Yeah. And they're going to be exaggerated throughout the season, whereas but clubs with bigger squads manage to even it out. Talk about peaks and troughs. They put 75 points on Treviso, and then they lose... You know, they they lose to Edinburgh. Well, there, there's another club in decline, is Treviso. I mean, they were yeah, really they murdered are. by Connacht. Yeah, but well, pushed out. their players are escaping to Leicester as well. Seems to be yeah, the season's a bit for them. I, I think, think I think there's a certain amount of uncertainty about what funding model will be in place yeah. for Treviso mm. next season. Or Benetton um, getting a pain in their. Maybe they are. You know, I I don't th- I I can't see Benetton work, walking away from the club. They might walk away from the franchise. They might also um, just give them less money. Yeah. Mm. Um, they might just take the role of a of a sponsor as opposed to pretty much you know bankrolling the, the entire club. Yeah. Um, they won't they won't walk away from the Division de Excelencia or whatever they call it uh, club because that's their club. It's to a certain extent it's their works team. Mm-hmm. The, the 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 Pro Twelve franchise, the Federation, uh, the FIOR might take it over, um, lock, stock, and barrel because it is a problem. Uh, they're getting half the funding that Erroneer, yeah. you know, um, yeah, uh, Zebra, sorry. I'm stuck in some mm-hmm. kind of time warp <laughs> today. Um, so just to go back to Edinburgh, um, it was good to see like they played at Megatland, mm. um, 
and it looked like a rugby ground. It looked like a rugby match taking place on a yeah. rugby ground. It was good to see. I played back there in '91, and uh, I mean, really? I couldn't, I couldn't get over it that uh, when so long ago the ball was square. It was. <laughs> and it was. Uh, he was actually part of that British Empire building thing. <laughs> Four points for try day. But mm. I remember going there, and like they had a stand that was roughly the same size as the stand that's in Donnybrook now, and it was a great facility, you know. And like, I'm surprised that they. That Edinburgh on. rugby haven't kept going and moving it to clubs like that and even put a temporary stand around the other mm. side something like that was it called Mega Death Land in your days well? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, can't rem- I can remember RFC. going there I can't remember leaving yeah. mm. so, so that was nice pretty good to come from, but, um, and then of course the, the last result we have to talk about is uh, Zebra doing the double over Cardiff that's Cardiff, right yeah 15-10 victory and uh, Phil Davies fell Another on the sword row walks there's, after, after a result like that, I mean, there's not, not much else you can do. Cardiff mm. seem to be... Free fall. Leaving aside the war between the WRU and RRW, Cardiff in and of themselves seem to be a little bit of a shambles. But they the seem moment. to be getting their act together. They moved out of the football ground, back to their own traditional ground. They got this new 4G, 4G pitch, 4G pitch in, mm-hmm. which you know, everyone thought was going to lead itself to play great, attractive, um, open, free running. And you know the crowd seemed to be coming back to support them, but... Whatever's happening in the club, it just seems to be in terminal decline. Mm. It's yeah, it's hard to put your finger on, um, but they're just, like like a lot of the Welsh clubs, they seem to uh, the fact that they lose players to France and England as well seems to unearth a lot of especially backs, very decent backs mm. that are being unearthed. But unfortunately, it's just not coming tr- through at enough in enough numbers, and mm. you know it's not. But like they are the one team in the Pro 12 that should be able to match the Irish teams because they're coming from the capital city, you know, maybe mm. a population of, I don't know, 300, 300 or 400,000 people in Cardiff, I'm not sure of the population, but they certainly have, you know, a, a, enough of a fan base there or a potential fan base. They have a tradition of being the club in mm. Wales for a long, long time. And you would think that they, you know, get their, their, their act together and become, you know, a very, very successful team, but they just haven't seemed to, like... When the, when the first year that we won the Heineken Cup in uh, 09, you know, they had an opportunity. They were beaten in that semi-final semi, yeah, mm-hmm. and beaten on pens. Jamie Roberts came back and scored two tries in the last few minutes. Yeah, yeah they were beaten on the penalties yeah, at the be, very uh, end. Uh, Williams had one off the bar. Mm. Martin Williams had one yeah. off the bar. Um, the question is, for Car- was it the right thing to, if you like, sever all ties with their patrimony, you know, mm. when they moved away from the Arms Park? Yeah, well, that was the biggest mistake. I mean, then they're moving they back and they're trying to get that. it back. On top of which, you have, you know, let's be honest, the huge inferiority complex the Wales, the Welsh have towards the English mm. that plays into their attitude towards everything to do with rugby. Um, you also have the uh, the the Ponty Preed side of their region, yeah. which is always trying to you know backstab them a little yeah. bit or mm. to, you know break away. Uh, and also the fact that Car- there's there's another issue is that Cardiff. Uh, athletic club I think own Cardiff Arms Park and yeah. they won't allegedly won't let a team without the word Cardiff in it play there so that's why they haven't just changed it the Blues they're Cardiff Blues still uh, and the people in Ponty have a chip on their shoulder that they're just a Cardiff team mm. uh, and you know so there's always there's, just, there's a lot of story going but on the, there the problem you know? is that the Blues are A too much of a Cardiff team and B not enough of a, of a Cardiff, Cardiff team exactly That's it's exactly only it. the Welsh can get themselves into mm-hmm. this situation they really it's a, it's unbelievable how they manage it yeah and one other game we didn't talk about was Ulster beating the Dragons um, mm. 30, 38-8 mm. Tommy Bo Tommy Bo got a nice back. couple of uh, couple yeah, of tries yeah he looked really back. good as well he yeah, looked really yeah. sharp um, felt a little twinge apparently little twinge took him off no need to no need to risk him they had you know some fairly uh, outstanding young talent on the bench in Mr. Skulls, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, and the the wee ginger lad done good. The boy Skulls, the boy Skulls done good, but uh, no. another young lad uh, had a bit of another um, problem. Luke Marshall went off concussed again. Yes, yeah, not good to a see. Fort a fort concussion in probably a year. Well, they're making a big deal of that. I mean, it's his first well, concussion sta- in eleven months. I know, but so. he was stu- he was stood down for three or four months last season. Yeah. Don't forget, you know, rightly I mean, and rightly so. Yeah, fair enough. But you know, it is kind of a hopefully not going to be a reoccurring thing that he's mm-hmm. going to be consistently uh, plagued by this. You know? He took a serious boot to the head, though. I mean, you know, mm. it no. wouldn't be concussed in fairness. Purely accidental. Oh, totally. Concussed. He's his own player. I mean, to a certain extent, there's, a, there's an amount of post hoc ergo proctor hoc kind of rationalisation about Whatever what's, what's, what's going on here. You know, yes, he took a load of, he took a number of cushions last year, but even if he hadn't, he would have been concussed after that boot. Mm. Exactly. You know, so whether one is as a result of the other or not is open for debate. What, what we do know is that he has had this fourth concussion now 
So there are, you know, issues around that because he had, he has had four concussions within the space of a. Now the first three, I I would say are related. Whether For this sure. fourth one is or isn't is irrelevant now mm. because it's it's the fourth one. And you, and you look at what's happened with with, with uh, Clark in in in, in uh, Connacht where they've had to stand mm. him down yeah. indefinitely because of the huge number of concussions he's had. I mm. mean. But it is a bit of a, bud, a buzzword around in the media. Oh, it is. Now, isn't al- it? I mean, it, it, well, always- again, rightly so. I mean, it's look at the look at the trouble in American football, mm. um, and you don't want to end up in that situation. In, That's true. In rugby, you know. So yeah, you have to be very vigilant. Because take it very there serious. is a slight difference in American football in that they went down a route where they allowed their equipment to determine the, yeah. the playing style. Um, I mean, you could get rid of pretty much all concussions in American football if you just took the helmets off the players. Exactly. Mm. You know, I mean. Yeah. They do lead with the head in American football. Yeah, because, because the, 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 the playing st- and they charge and the, their playing style is determined by their mm. their equipment. Take the equipment yeah. off them, you find that the playing style would change rapidly, and what? the number of injuries and type of injuries would change rapidly. So, American football kind of is, exists in its own little bubble because of its equipment led, yeah, uh, tactical yeah. approach. Whereas, whereas in rugby, you've got, you, I mean, there's no. No, you're not allowed to lead with the head in rugby. You're not allowed to lead. You bloody injure yourself yeah. if you lead with but the head. But you're not allowed to do it anyway. So there's no, it happens, but it happens by accident in rugby as opposed to as a result of a deliberate act in, in America. Get your football. head on the wrong side of a tackle yeah. in rugby and you're in serious yeah. trouble, you know. But that's, that's, that's my point. I mean, if you do it wrong, it's yeah. an accident. But in American football, it's part of a, a tactical approach. Yeah. But um, you've got, we've got a very talented young player and the question is, what do we do now? I don't, you see, the thing is, I mean, I'm not a medical expert. I've never been concussed. I would all have a rashes about it. All I know is what I read in the papers. And the problem is that the papers have, as you said, used it as the buzzword. It is it is for this generation what creatine was for ours. Hmm. But that's true. I mean, every week. Or you even, you know, two or three years ago, the whole talk was tip tackles. And, yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. and, and yeah, the media moved on to something else. This And it'll be something else in a few years. I mean, you, months, you remember when time. we were teenagers in our early 20s, every rugby, art, there was at least one feature article every Sunday, yeah. be it either in the rugby or the GAA section, about creating. Yeah. And this, now we've got into a situation where there's one article almost every Sunday, be it in the rugby or the GAA section, mm. about concussion. Now, that's not to say it's not a very serious issue. It is. But I know nothing about it, yeah. and I'm prepared to bet most of the journalists writing about it. I'd rather know take, not much more. I'd rather take creatine every day for the rest of my life than uh, get concussed on a regular basis. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm not sure that the health benefits would be all that much different. <laughs> really? <laughs> Better stop. Well, so. I mean, like, you know, <laughs> but like people, you know, it's like ten years ago, there was obviously with the, the young uh, GA f- uh, Gaelic footballer who who died of sudden sudden adult death. Yeah, and, back and, and similar to the to the young lad who was playing for Irish schools. I James think. McCall. Yeah, you know, and, and like There's that a was guy up the north in the schools game there the last year. Robinson, yeah. Ben Robinson. Yeah. I think. and like you know, again, so the media focusing on these things, and I like, guess just sort of. But yeah. having said that, saying, it, it is a very serious thing. Serious. Yeah. Oh, of course. What, what we have to do as well, we do have to take it seriously, but we have to trust that the uh, that the union. Who, for all that we may criticise about various things, they've never been particular. They've never been uh, uncaring as to player safety. Mm. I mean, player safety has always been very important. Yeah, but it's so. interesting. I think a lot of the time, players are the ones who put their oh, safety. They're the ones who want to get back and, on. Yeah, and that's my next point. Uh, yeah. The problem has always been. You read any player's autobiography, Trico, and they will talk to you point. about one of the first things they do every season is fake their cog test mm. results, mm. so that they can match them later on the season if they have taken yeah. a back and if you're sweating your if you're sweating your you know your arse off trying to get on a team and you're mm. training 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 and you're you've just made it into the team and if if you get concussed and you you you, you own up to it and you're out for a month you know you're back to square one that's and the other lads are moving on but you see that well that's the thing you know there's a there's a lot there's enough responsibility to go around everywhere you know um it's not the union's fault the union from what i can see seem to be moving on this issue and there's sit- Every day there's a new high power panel been announced, um, but the players have a, have a responsibility to their own future selves. Yeah, you know, and to their to their future families to be in a mm. position where they're not, you know, yeah. turning their brains into into mushy peas. They always say though that if you gave an Olympic athlete uh, a pill that would win them the gold medal in the Olympics and kill them within a year, that a huge proportion of them would take it. Those lads in curling so. are gas though. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, Ireland are playing in the Viva against Italy at the weekend. Going to be Drico's last home international. If selected. If selected. <laughs> he's, he, if selected, he will break George Gregan's international appearance and go yeah. 40 caps. Exactly. Like ferocious. Yeah, and you have to go back to, you know, you, yeah, you just have to take the time to step back, 
and look at the guy's career and you know it, like we get we're ruined we watch him every week uh, doing his magic um, and we've been watching him for years and we're kind of spoiled and yeah. it's only now when he's when it's coming near the end that we're going we kind of have to not see this anymore mm. and you know well, we've been privileged for the last 15 if, years seeing him in green exactly. and blue jerseys if you look back on I mean to pick out you could pick out so many highlights but just the first uh, the third try of his hat trick against against France where he ran at pace and okay he came in under the radar in that game but he'd already scored two tries you've got mm. to think that the French were keeping an eye on him and he ran in at pace and picked the ball up on the run which to this day, I don't really know how he managed mm. to do that at that speed. He scored a similar and try against, against the All Blacks in 2010. The one-handed pickup yeah. that day was just... It was unbelievable. And that, uh, I can still remember where I was. It's like to say about the JFK thing. I could, a friend of mine was having a, a son's confirmation. and We were all standing around the telly in disbelief looking at it. You know, mm. uh, And it sticks out in my mind ever since. Uh, just... And that's so early in his career, and the amount of you could pick, you can pick out and other he made, highlights he made if you up want. For it next year, he's scoring the try that never was, mm. or that's the right. try that never should have been. Mm. But the, I mean, you can you can make a hundred, you can make a, a full Blu-ray of Ryan O'Driscoll's uh, highlights, and you'd need more than one disc. You'd need one for attack, one for assists, and one for defense. Mm-hmm. You know, because the guy, had, I mean, apart from being, you know, the world record caps holder. You know, Irish record try scorer, etc., etc., etc. Six He's Nations top best try back, scorer. Best too. back row forward Ireland has produced in years. <laughs> I mean, he really is, and we've produced some good ones. Mm. But I mean, for me, it was all about the the the, the game in, against England in Croke Park, the second one, mm-hmm. where you know England targeted him, did yeah. everything to take him out of that game, and still, who was there? With a yard out, burrowing through two forwards to score a try, mm. the Brian O'Driscoll. And that was just after he was almost taken yeah. off, concussed. Yeah. Guy, absolute warrior. There's no, there's no other word for it. There was a great interview in the Irish Times last Saturday with him, and he mentioned that uh, 19 or 09 season. And I remember hearing an interview that his father gave, and he, you know, he said, "Well, O'Driscoll's played. Your son's been brilliant." And he says, "It's the first year that he's actually played injury free or relatively injury free." Yeah. And, you know, as you saw, like, with the performance that he put in against Munster in the semi-final, getting the drop goal in this final against, uh, against Leicester, mm-hmm. obviously then the, um, the, the Grand Slam and then topping it off by going on the Lions Tour, yeah. where he, unfortunately, I, I really feel that, you know, he, he, we should have won the Lions Series that year and only yeah, just his crown and so glory. Close. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, I've heard it said during the week that he, he uh, reckons himself that, that all nine year was his best. That he he still had his pace and his attack, yeah. and his defense. Like his mind had worked out all the combinations in defense. Earlier in his career, he was a fabulous swashbuckling attacker, but maybe he didn't have quite the reads in defense. And later, he lost a bit of pace and couldn't really charge around people the way he used to. But he reckons that was the the sweet spot yeah. in the middle of his career. Definitely. Yeah. But anyway, there's more than there, just. There are other people playing. There are indeed, on Saturday. And, and John, you'd be delighted to know that Zebo's back in the squad. I actually am delighted. Yeah. I've, I would have would have got him back in, maybe even for England. But uh, you know, who's going out? I'd start him and and, and either bench Trimble or uh, leave Trimble out altogether. Not because he's been playing badly. He did have a little bit of a blip in the in the England game, but I just think there's a bit of a spark there, like. I don't know whether he f- back against Cardiff. I, d- I don't know whether he fits Joe Schmidt's game plan or not, and if he does, great, and if he doesn't, that's fine too. But uh, he, he does have that spark, that t- unpredictability hmm. that can create something, and you know we might need a bit of that against Italy well, to. There are two things we need to do against to Italy. score a few tries. <laughs> First know? is to win the game, and then the second is to score a buttload of points. Yeah. So, but you can't do no point doing the second if you don't do the first. So that's the first true. thing we have to do is win the game. And to that end, you pick as much of the team really that's got, that, you know, subjugated Scotland and Wales mm-hmm. and to a certain extent play very well against England. And then you, I, I'd load as many quicks like Zebo on yeah. the bench and then bring them on once the Italian team has been run into the ground and torn around the pitch. Mm, yeah. You know, because one thing we have that over them in absolute spades is fitness. Mm-hmm. Um, if we run them, if and we depth and depth, if we move them around the pitch enough, they will be out on their feet fifty five, maybe sixty minutes. Then bring on a load of quick guys and absolutely start bucketing in tries because we do. It is a points chase, mm-hmm. but it's a points chase that has to follow a victory. 
Well, if we can uh, if we can get enough points on the board that we could dispirit whoever wins the France England game, um, mm. because whoever wins that, they're not probably not going to run away with it. Uh, would be my guess. Mm. Uh, and then it'll leave either uh, Wales to score a bucket load of tries in Scotland on a crappy pitch, um, or it'll leave England to go to Italy um, and score a bucket load of tries over there, which. Rome isn't the best place in the world to be going looking for a bucket load of tries, you know. As we know from last year. Uh, as yeah. we know from well, last year. For, for two, two. First of all, it, it is actually a narrow pitch. Mm-hmm. Um, and second is, England have proven themselves to be a lot better than anyone thought that they would be at this stage. But I still, but I think that at the, without that knowledge, this is the game Italy will have targeted. Yeah. Because it's the one, they've never beaten England. Yeah, and they're And also, they have them at home mm-hmm. and they have a fairly strong team that are, are, are a bit more mature than they were in the past. I, so I think England win. I think they win easy, but I don't think they. Don't it, think they score a book If they had to go over tries. and score fifty, I don't know if they'd be able to do that. So if we can score a few tries against Italy, and of course, more importantly, win the game, uh, we will hopefully be faced. Well, a we we will know exactly what we have to do because we're playing last against France. Uh, but b we will all we will have to do hopefully is just win the game, even by yeah. a point, and we'll win the championship. At least you know, yeah. fingers crossed. That's, that's, the, that's, that's the options I hope we'll have we after this weekend. Yeah. What we want to, out, out of this Italy game is to leave us in a position where all we have to do is beat France. Mm-hmm. That's the ideal mm. situation. Um, we score. We we already have a decent uh, points difference tally. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're way out. We're twenty yeah. points clear of England. We build on that. Um, put a good, you know, maybe even thirty or forty points on it. Best case scenario, obviously. Oh, then no, Dave. But that well, we won by thirty two points uh, yeah. two seasons ago. We won forty two ten. That will dispirit the opposition, you know. And we have more talent, and we have a more innovative coach. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we could even who who knows if Johnny is fit or not. Nobody knows. Um, would we start with Jackson? Would well, Madigan come into the uh, as part of that? I'd say both of them will have a go. Yeah, if as no part Johnny. of that. Uh, 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 more expressive approach towards the end in order to gain point, points well, I know that, Ian Madigan on I know that Smith did want to increase the number of, of players that he's used um, this I think is the game by, to do it in by three or four and it is an opportunity to bring in some other guys like I'm thinking I know he's already played like Marty Moore but I wonder if he'll start Marty Moore and, and bench Ross I can't see him making wholesale changes because as we mentioned last week it will be three weeks bef- since the um, England game up right up to the France game so I can't see him resting I do, he, think, he has, I do think Ross demonstrated on, on Saturday that he's better starting than he is coming on and Marty Moore is more of a weapon coming on than he is mm. well he, know, he has options he has Marty. options you know he in the front row him at half time maybe, he, is, but he has options in the second row I mean, obviously O'Connell is, isn't going to be dropped as captain but he could decide to give Devin Toner a rest maybe start Henderson there yeah. you know yeah. and he has that option because even Dunnock Ryan even Dunnock Ryan there's another option um his guys in the back row ch- changes he can make so Mike, uh, a half back Mike McCarthy I think yeah, I think, uh, think Ruddock's in with a sh- and with a shout certainly Shep. a bench spot. Ruddock has to be in with a huge shout we've got to the situation now. it's like, funny like, like, if, you, if you go back to the philosophy of, of Schmidt which is kind of rewarding people who've been proving themselves and I, I do take there's a caveat with that that Ruddock has played exceptional in the last three or four weeks however he's playing exceptionally against much much lesser oh, yeah. opposition yeah, yeah. and similar to Zebo as well you know, he scored a truckload of yeah. tries but you do have to say, well, these guys are showing form at the moment. And they are. You can only go out and play against what's in front of you. Mm-hmm. And when they're playing in front of them, they're coming away as well, clear victors. That's the two things uh, it, Schmidt has to balance up. He has to balance up, like you say, Ruddock and Zebo playing really, really well against, you know, not quite top-rate opposition. Mm-hmm. As opposed to, we we'll say, Piramani or uh, Henderson. Who have played extremely well against yes. Super or Trimble yeah. or McFa- or uh, uh, Carney Dave Dave Carney mm-hmm. who have played well against the very best opposition. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So you've got you've got all that stuff to balance. I mean, it's a, it's a balancing act. But we're getting to the situation now with Joe's uh, Ireland team, like we were, to, which is the complete opposite to what we were with maybe Eddie O'Sullivan and Declan Kidney's Irish team. You mean Joe Schmidt, who's never won an away match in his whole career with Ireland? <laughs> Not Joe Schmidt. Yeah, that one. Oh. But we're getting to a situation, almost getting to a situation already this shortly into his reign, where um, he has. We you could always tell what team Eddie was going to pick by and large if there were no injuries. Yeah. Same with Declan Kidney. Joe, is that, you never know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you never know with Joe, but yeah, he's still. You know, you have to be conservative as an Irish coach or as a, uh, an international coach 
unless you're coaching the All Blacks or whoever, you know, unless you've got so much talent. Mm. Well, you see, what he's done is he's created an atmosphere where he can actually be conservative by bringing in experienced players. But he has such a pool now of experienced players, mm-hmm. a wider pool of experienced players. And in fairness, a lot of the, a lot of these guys were blooded under Declan and Kidney, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have to give credit there. But he has a wider pool of experienced players yeah. than he had. I mean, no sa- no coach ever got sacked for picking experienced guys. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's just that he has so many of them now. I yeah. mean, you're talking about if you make change to the halfback. I mean, Paddy Jackson's been around the block a couple of times now. Yeah. Ian Madigan. Even. Well, we'll see if they have faith in him with with Sexton's injury. I mean. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I don't know how bad his injury is, but Sexton. if if there is a doubt about him, do you rush him back for the Italy game or do you keep him in reserve for the like? And, but but let's say Sexton doesn't start. Who do you go for? Do you go for for Jackson or do you go for Madigan? I personally wouldn't start Sexton. I personally wouldn't. Mm. I mean, he's too important for the game against France. Absolutely. I mean, and Paddy Jackson and Ian Madigan are very Italy very good first. players. Gotta, Paddy, yeah. I I firmly believe, and I think Joe firmly believes that both those out halves are capable of guiding Ireland to a win against Italy. Mm. Um, I would nearly go with the with Jackson to start um, Madigan to come on, yeah. uh, as the more structured player to move Italy around the park and then have Madigan to come on with the, for the last half hour, maybe 40 minutes, and you know rip them. I wouldn't be a bit disappointed to see that. In fact, I think it would be great for the team. Um, and he may well do that. But he could also just do a smash and grab with Sexton, get him on, and as soon as we're... Looking mm-hmm. clear, throw on one or the other two, and for me, it'd possibly be Madigan because he m- might be more likely to give you a bit of a spark in that situation. In yeah. that situation, well, that's the thing. If Sexton doesn't start, it's it, it's like this again. If, if Sexton, Sexton doesn't, doesn't start, start it's, it's Jackson, Jackson is the starter, yeah. Yeah. right? But if Sexton does start in this in this particular set of circumstances, it might be Madigan on the bench. It might be but Madigan on the bench. It's, it's it's the kind of the. But we've seen him go for horses for courses mm. before, which much more so than any other Irish coach. Or certainly, sorry, when he was in his Leinster Horses days. Horses for game plans. Yeah, exactly. Like, mm. I mean, you know, we just have to think about all the times that he's picked Boss going away or a big back row in the, mm. you know, for the away games in a totally different Damian team. Damien Brown. Damien Brown, yeah. yeah. And, you know, maybe he'll do something like that. But just before we, like, we just want to rattle through this couple of things. There's 38,000 tickets sold for the Munster match, which was mm-hmm. quite mm-hmm. impressive. Like, I think that looks like it's going to be a sell. No, and the hype hasn't really started. Yeah, yeah. No, it's still, it's still, a few years. But you've still got the weeks. Six Nations people yeah. are focused on yeah. that, you know. It's got... Three plenty of time number. to plenty of time to yeah. one, once once you hit thirty five thousand you're in you're in clover you know mm. and mm. we're in clover yeah and the other thing I just want to briefly mention is uh, Ian McKinley coming back oh yeah. brilliant absolutely really brilliant good. yeah yeah playing for uh, in the spectacles uh, Leonorso is that what they're called Leonorso yeah, of uh, rugby Udine mm. um, great to see him back I mean it's such it, it was so sad to lose him i mean because he looked like he was moving he into gone, yeah. i mean he was he was kind of ahead of madigan you know in the yeah, old yeah, in the old race you know sure um he was a class player he had all the attributes mm. all the attributes um yeah. we were talking about earlier about some players been one type or been possibly jackson and madigan would both be behind them at yeah, this stage yeah. for Ireland, yeah. it's it, it is quite possible you can never tell but it's great to see him back playing again and yeah. i hope mm. i really hope he gets as much out of it as he as as, as he as he wants to get out of it you know yeah, the the only other bit of uh, news that's kind of shocked me during the week is that uh, about journalists giving credence to this thing about uh, the IRFU might buy back the second year of Sexton's contract. Might pay off my mortgage as well. So are, are they mad? Like you know, uh, why would they? Why would they do that? Because a, they're going to be looking for a shed load of money. You can bet. Uh, B, his contract's up three months before the World Cup. So what's the panic? Uh, I think there's a C there as well. C, you could I, rest them this summer for the Argentina tour, which they probably will. Well, I think there's actually the other C is that I don't think Would Sexton that be a D? or D perhaps <laughs> C plus. But anyway, I think that in for Sexton, I don't, I can't see him walking out on a contract. Oh God, no! I, you know, as well, I'm sure he wants to prove to himself that and prove to others that he can hack it over year, there. Yeah, yeah. And you know, his, I heard that he'd give it, he's given his fir- first full interview in French. So he's obviously buying he's into the you know, mean, learning not, language and I so mean, on. In order to buy out his, his contract, the player would have to be willing. The club would have to be willing. The president would have to be willing. And the IRFU would have to And the IRFU would have to be willing. I actually think, huge that, wedge but I think it's probably played into the IRFU's hand a little bit because they said, well, look, it's not all clover over there. 
Um, of course. You know, and yeah. it's probably showing them when there's another guy coming up for contract uh, renegotiation, they, they can say, well, you can, if you go, but look, it's not. Yeah, un- unless, of course, Johnny's having a great time over there. Well, well it's, it's been done knows. to death, though, in fairness, <laughs> hasn't it? It's it like has. Look, it was a, the, the narrative was decided before he even went to France. Yeah. The narrative was going to be that Sexton will play way more games Which and will has. get injured all the time mm. and will, you know, have Looks a terrible tired, time at least. and it'll be horrible. Yes, he's played more games because he's the only out half out of three that's fit because he was uh, a number of them the have season, been injured. Yeah. He got injured mm-hmm. on Irish duty, mm-hmm. right? He hasn't looked miserable over there. He seems to be enjoying his time over there. He's got plenty of pals over there from the Lions tour. So the, it doesn't matter whether it's happened or not. The narrative was decided before he even went. Plus, he's a miserable faker anyway, so he's always going to It's hard miserable. to know, yeah. He always looks grumpy. But then, you know, show me a happy out half and I'll show you one who's losing. Mm. <laughs> exactly. Well, anyway, thanks a million, boys. Thanks a million for watching. If you're going to the Viva at the weekend, enjoy. Cheers. Oh,